Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Crillo. Today we have Dave Van Horn. Dave has raised over $200 million for both notes and commercial real estate, and he owns a considerable portfolio of residential investment properties, as well as various commercial holdings. His company, PPR Note Co., manages several funds that buy, sell, and hold residential mortgages nationwide. So thanks so much for being on the show, Dave. Oh, my pleasure. How are you doing, Charles? So give us a little bit about your background, both personally and professionally, prior to getting involved in real estate investing. Uh, prior to real estate investing? Um, well, when I got out of college, I well, during college, I worked for a contractor, a painting contractor, and uh, continued doing that. And then eventually became a small business owner myself uh, as a contractor and a part-time real estate agent. And that's kind of how I morphed you know, into real estate. I really had no um, like retirement. So some of the uh, other realtors that were training me were like their retirement were the houses they had, their rentals, you know? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So is there another reason why you chose real estate as your investment vehicle when you started out? <laughs> yeah. Cause I got out of college and couldn't really get a job in my field, which is <laughs> uh, ironic. I was a business major and look at me today, right? I'm the CEO. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, my mom still says that to me, like, are you going to get a real jo job? Like I was telling her, I was taking a course and she's like, oh, that's good. I hope, hope you'll be able to get, you know, you'll be able to be more like hireable, you know? And I'm like, N I don't know that I can't, I'm already the CEO. <laughs> so where do you want me to go? So you get, you know, I'm probably a bad employee at this point, put it that way. Oh yeah. I think all good entrepreneurs are bad employees. Um, I would consider myself a bad employee. The, um, so let's break down kind of you, your firm as in, uh, involved with a lot of notes and note funds. So after uh, you guys have done 10,000 plus notes and uh, what's your firm's investment note criteria and strategy when you guys are, uh, give us a little background of kind of like how the process works and then how your fund works. So in the beginning, we were, we specialized in the junior lien space and it was because it had a lower barrier to entry. And most of the time, unless they're high value junior liens, um, you're not as geographic centric. Uh, so you could, you know, buy junior liens almost anywhere, you know? Uh, but a lot of times, uh, you know, then we, you know, grew in size and we morphed into more, uh, first mortgages. And today we do a lot of commercial mortgages, that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of it does uh, revolve around population centers, you know, where there's people. Uh, we tend to do better than like, say, in rural areas, things like that. But most of what we buy today is through our JV partners, where we buy, you know, massive quantities. And then they, they run actual trade desks. So today, it's not that you would not do business in any given state. It, you may limit your concentrations in particular states or... Uh, based on, uh, we have like legal timelines and cost matrices. So they'll, mm. but a lot of assets are discounted if they're in a less desirable location too, right? So you got to factor all of that in. So there's, I have a partner that says that sometimes there's no bad note, just bad pricing, right? So it's, uh, <laughs> so they, they build those discounts in, you know, like into less mm -hmm. favorable states or more litigious states or states that have longer foreclosure timelines, those assets trade at different uh, amounts, you know? Interesting. So when you're so, where are you sourcing your notes from? And is it right now, are you really doing junior liens or is it really senior? Actually, uh, we, senior we do very, other than legacy asset uh, portfolios, we don't do a lot of junior liens at all. It's mostly all uh, first mortgages and commercial loans and a lot of what, you know, we do some reverse mortgages like Heckam loans mm -hmm. from HUD. Mm -hmm. uh, most of our assets, other than those from some GSEs, government agencies, um, most of them are through trade desks, uh, all institutional. Like we don't do any, you know, contract for deed type stuff or, you know, seller finance notes. We're really, we really don't do that. We're really in, uh, you know, institutional originated mortgages, you know. 
Mostly okay. one to four family is a big piece of it. Um, but then we do short-term business loans, which are hard, you know, hard money loans. We also do commercial construction loans. Um, so we, we don't uh, necessarily originate them, but our partners do. So today we uh, you know, outsource more than we did in the beginning. In the beginning, we, we were asset managers. Today, we're more of you know, capital allocators, so to speak, with good operators. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So is there a certain criteria or strategy when you're looking at, say, the majority of your debts are going to be a first position, one to four units, so residential properties. Uh, so is there something other than using your, how you, how you had it before for your strategy for every state, obviously, if it's more litigious or if it's harder to work in, there's going to be a different amount that your formula is going to come up with to pay. But other than that, is there... Um, are you looking for certain notes when you're sourcing them that are uh, discounted because they're non-performing up to a certain amount or kind of what's your sweet spot of what you're looking at when you're sourcing these? <laughs> I'm actually not part of acquisitions, but they do have criteria and it's also market driven. So the, you know, what happens in it, you know, they're, uh, how do I say this? Note values are a direct correlation to real estate values. So in an up real estate market, they're trading it at a different margin than in a down market. Uh, probably the biggest market condition is probably unemployment. You know, if unemployment's high, this sector of our, this channel of our business does well. Uh, whereas, you know, a lot of our commercial stuff, uh, we're tied into originators. So whereas in the non-performing loans, they're already existing and we're buying stuff that's in default. So defaults tick up when unemployment's high, that kind of thing. And then we also invest, you know, we're looking at areas like, uh, Mortgage servicing rights, for example, where it's just a counter cyclical way to invest in the business where like say interest rates go up, mortgage servicing rights could become more value, valuable in those cases. So there's different channels within a channel that we can diversify into to you know spread some risk around. Interesting. Yeah, get a better right. risk adjusted return. Uh, Dave, what is your role at, uh, at your company? Well, I'm president and CEO, and my primary role, especially up until recently, was always on the capital side, capital raising side, okay. um, marketing, things like that. I would oversee them. I, but I also do re oversee our REO department, which is real estate owned. Okay. That's because I have a strong real estate background. And um, you know, we have an REO agent that dispositions hundreds of homes a year, you know, that kind of thing. And they're sprinkled throughout the country. Interesting. Interesting. So with what we're seeing now with what's going on uh, with COVID, how has that changed? I mean, kind of we're on, I would say the downswing of that, but uh, how did that affect your business over the last in 2020 and 20, early 2021? Well, it was, uh, you know, it's interesting at first uh, it was hard to tell what was going to happen, but you, I guess the biggest impact was moratoriums, right? Because it, uh, it's clogged up the courthouses, right? So we're just starting to come out of that. I, I just got a report today. It's about 60% roughly, you know, is, is functioning again, you know, where you can get, get through the courthouse systems. So we're, we're, you're going to see a bunch of pent up demand, um, basically a clogged toilet <laughs> foreclosures <laughs> trying to get through. Um, so we anticipate it's going to take a little bit longer. Uh, prior to like when we were completely shut down, we were actually shifting a lot of strategies, shifting things around. Um, there was different pricing based on that. For example, uh, we were doing deed and lose strategies, things like that, where we were trying to, I don't say circumvent the courthouse, but in a way that's what it was. Yeah. Um, so it did, it did limit revenue, for example, in certain buckets uh, of, you know, certain revenue sectors of the company would be, you know, impacted by the moratoriums. But the good news is it is asset, it, it is asset backed. And right now you're seeing real estate values are still pretty high and people are still looking for deals. It's still a seller's market. So we're getting really good execution yeah. on what we do sell. Uh, we're actually selling stuff much higher than we thought. A lot of stuff that's going to the foreclosure sale, we're putting it full, you know, uh, what we're owed, you know, full bid, you know, yeah. like, cause, cause, if it comes back, we make more is really what happens, you know? So, right. Yeah. We're actually hoping stuff doesn't sell at sale. I know that sounds bizarre. No, that's what happens in, in, most in cases, a market I like this. It's crazy. Case, but most cases, you're hoping yeah. that it doesn't sell at sale. You'll have better execution when it comes back, you know? 
So the strategy with you guys is you're finding notes, most likely non-performing. You're trying to turn them to performing and then sell them. Is that kind of how it goes? It is if they're occupied. If right. they're vacant, you're, it, you, it's just, you're buying property, really. It's just one extra step. You got to clear the title if it's vacant. Yeah. So um, like when we buy a lot, for example, I mentioned reverse mortgages. When we buy reverse mortgages, uh, they're usually all vacant and deceased borrowers. So we're really buying property. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Uh, I was looking on your website when doing research, and it's uh, you guys are pretty much in every state. Is there? I mean, it was crazy. I was looking for states that you weren't in, but uh, you're everywhere. Uh, really heavily in, I think, uh, is it New York, Florida, and California? Obviously, those are biggest states. But um, is there states that you like? I mean, what are the states that really know people are looking for where it's a little easier for you to, where you could pay higher for, I guess, or there's less chance of getting the hassle with going through um, so much with courts and the foreclosure process isn't as difficult, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you know, the old rule of thumb would be, um, you know, deed of trust states instead of judi judicial states. Um, you know, states like Texas and Georgia were quick states, but those assets trade higher, right? So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So they factor that in or there's not as many available, right? Cause they get gobbled up. Like Texas is probably, you know, the number one state for some of that, um, you know, where it could be, uh, you know, lender friendly or just like landlord friendly states, you know, so they exist. But I think a lot of it has to do with what's available in the marketplace at any given time. So we don't necessarily, we can only buy what's available too. Right. So, and then some states just don't have a lot of assets. So if I was in Wyoming, there's not a lot of Wyoming loans. <laughs> there's not a lot of Vermont loans, you know, they're just, cause they're just, yeah. you know, small, small states. states or not a lot of population, you know, so it, some of that's a function of that. And then some of it is a, you know, directly correlated to how much distress they had in an area or how long their foreclosure timelines are like New Jersey or New York, or, you know, they tend to be longer uh, timelines there are some things you can do to accelerate some of that stuff too. And that's where, you know, having a good legal team uh, is helpful. Also compliance, you want to, you know, be dialed into the compliance of a particular state, you know, what licenses are required, those types of things. And uh, that becomes a whole nother matrix. Yeah. So. so you're generating, uh, you're sourcing a lot of these uh, loans from originators and uh, what's your exit strategy? Where are you really, where are you selling these? So what's the secondary market? Are they going to uh, institutional people? Are they going to private investors? Are they going to private equity? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, <laughs> some of them, you know, uh, we have a big portfolio. We've probably acquired, for example, in the last year, just in the one channel, about 68 million in assets. That portfolio will get securitized and sold and sold off. So, mm -hmm. um, and then we have other assets that we disposition ourselves. Um, where a lot of it becomes REO property, especially if they're vacant, that kind of thing. And then, um, and then we do, you know, we do modifications as well. And then once those modifications are seasoned, especially in this market, they they go back to almost par, you know, they're getting good execution wow. right now. So, um, it almost, you know, it almost right now, it almost always pays us to hold the assets till they're performing with some history and then sell them and you get better. Execution. And it's usually like, what do you have to usually uh, season them or how long do they have to perform like 12 for months, before the yeah. 12, yeah. 12 months is, you know, okay, that's where no, you don't have to, you could sell them pre earlier, but you're going to get, you're going to catch a tailwind if you do that. You know, so. mm -hmm. And it's, that's not yeah. always the case. It's function of this market we're in right now. So, you know, we started back in 2007. So we've been through multiple cycles and you'll, you'll see, you know, the way the market dictates things, you know, you shift gears uh, to get better execution, you know. Interesting. So we have a lot of listeners that are mostly on the equity side. And that's why I like bringing on uh, different investors that are kind of uh, making money in real estate and all different types of uh, portions of it. So why would you feel that note investing is a superior to the traditional, I guess, real estate investing strategies that you might hear, uh, you know, multifamily, all this other stuff, where it's a lot more active, I would say, or semi-passive if set up correctly. Yeah. You're not going to like my answer. Um, I, I don't know that I think it's superior. Um, I just think okay. it's different in how it's scalable, you know, since it's a paper asset still backed by real estate and uh, I do all the other things you mentioned. <laughs> so, 
so I, you know, I do multifamily and I do, uh, you know, regular real estate and I do, uh, mm -hmm. so it, it's not a case where I think, you know, one's better than another or anything. They're just different. And, um, you know, I believe everybody should have some, you know, section of paper assets in their portfolio, just like you should have some real estate or multifamily or, yeah. you know, commercial real estate. So I, I kind of have a lot of that different types of holdings. Um, I just happen to have a business in it and, and, um, it, it, you know, it's very scalable, very scalable and, and it can be passive if you outsource certain things. So for me, it was kind of figuring out, you know, if you figure out what your strengths are, you can outsource the rest and, um, you know, hopefully that serves you well, you know? Yeah, for sure. I like the diversification portion of it. Uh, did you, when you're, can you give us like how the fund works in this? sense of how you're usually time frames work on it because obviously if you're passively investing or not obviously but passively investing in other kind of equity side of real estate investments you're really five seven ten years can you yes. kind of explain the process with how your note funds work because it's a little different and how it's structured and how someone who's never invested in a note fund um you know kind of uh, what they can expect yeah like our our terms are shorter and we have the ability to compound um, you know, we'll have like liquidity options where you can invest for six months, one year. Um, our longest term is usually three years and, you know, you, you hit on it pretty good. Cause you know, I've done a lot of syndication over the years, probably 20 years, over 20 years now. Um, and you know, a lot of syndications could be three, five, seven, 10 years long, especially in uh, longer, larger commercial projects, things like that. Um, so we kind of fit in a different niche, right? Um, just like there's some, um, short-term business loan funds or hard money funds that are, you know, maybe a year in length or, you know, short-term as well. So I think there's a place for all of this where um, as an investor myself and in running investor groups too, um, you know, investors like short-term, long-term, mid-term type of capital. Um, sometimes you marry the investment to tax strategies or, you know, it's which master are you serving? Um, me, I like yeah. to marry my money or type of money to the type of investment. You know, you see a lot of that. Uh, and then some people like the ability to compound or, you know, just to diversify into another, you know, asset backed, uh, investment vehicle, you know. Interesting. So the one thing was when we have people that are investing in our syndications, uh, passively and, uh, they might have a self-directed, uh, IRA of yeah. some sort. And, uh, one thing that's kind of a drawback, I guess you would say, is because they have the unrelated business taxable income, the UBTI. Is that something that now, because there's not the best tax benefits when note investing, let's say, because it comes out as ordinary income, is with the UBTI, is that something that you can kind of avoid now because you're not, in, you're not actually buying the property with debt on it? Or I've heard people go both ways on this because there is debt involved. You're just on the other side of it, but... So most of what we see is the UBIT usually applies for investors in investing in a note fund that utilizes leverage, um, mm. but not when you're buying a note. Because when you're buying a note, it's interest income or, or a, a capital gain you know, when you exit the note. So it's really, does that fund utilize leverage? And that's where the UBIT kind of sneaks in in a note fund. And some no funds do, and some no funds don't. And that's why I think it's, I don't want to say confusing, but it can be. And um, yeah, you know, it's just something that is there and just got to be aware of. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of times you'll see people put regular capital in as a, you know, if there's you, it, it depends how big UBIT's impacting you and whether you can offset it with something. Yeah. You know? Interesting. Yeah, of course. I don't want to put you on the spot there, but if anybody just uh, speak to your accountant about that, but yeah, it's just something go. interesting yeah. to keeping. I'm not a CPA it's something or attorney, nor do no, I no, want no. to be one. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, neither of us are. So it's just it's just something that uh, when you're passively investing, what you're doing with your S your uh, self directed IRA should be something that uh, you keep that as uh, because it could it will uh, offset or change your returns. No. Um, what are common mistakes you see note investors make? Um, maybe not doing enough due diligence on a note seller, for example, or maybe not having their end game in mind, or, you know, I guess one of the first decisions is are, how active or passive are you going to be? You know, do you want to be, you want to go buy a couple of notes and 
collect cash flow or do you want to run an active note business like mine, right? So they're completely different things where one has employees and all the all the good old trappings that go along with that stuff. <laughs> or do you want the, you know, I just want cash flow from an investment and I'm pretty passive, those types of things. And and I mentioned it earlier, like staying up to date on the compliance and the legal aspects of the industry and uh, you know, knowing where those pitfalls are, could be, you know, that kind of thing. Interesting. Okay. What do you think are the main factors that have contributed to your success over 30 years in real estate, both <laughs> equity and debt side? Um, probably maybe time persistence networking for sure, because, um, you know, we have a big, um, you know, investor audience and, uh, investor base. And, uh, you know, one of our forte is, you know, is raising capital, you know? Hmm. So that's one of our core competencies are one of our big strengths. In the commercial real estate, just uh, off top here, so like in the commercial real estate, it's a very small market uh, kind of industry, I guess, when you're talking, especially within like, let's just say multifamily. Is it with notes too, where it's very, people know the other funds? And I heard before someone was saying that, uh, you know, if you, uh, you, you know, you, it's, you get into a bad relationship with a note seller or something like this, and that person's like, they'll black, blacklist that guy from, or person, yeah, it, or business I mean, from buying. Is that, is that... It can happen with funding, you know, especially, um, okay. you know, a lot of times we have to close quicker maybe than multifamily sometimes, okay. you know, um, I, I watch my acquisition team. Sometimes they do diligence in a couple of days and have to perform very quickly. Uh, but then sometimes they may have up to a month. Well, a month is, could be shorter than multifamily, which might be, uh, it's called 60 or 90 yeah. days or something, you know, where you have. So that to us, that's like, oh man, that's all the time in the world. That's a lot of extra time, right? <laughs> but the, uh, especially if they're looking at a lot of assets, you know, I've seen them look at thousands of assets and have to do their diligence on thousands of assets instead of one asset. But, you know, sometimes one asset could have a couple hundred units, right? So it's not like you're not doing anything, but um, right. yeah, I mean, you know, you see it though. Interesting. So how can our listeners learn more about you and your business, Dave? Uh, probably the easiest way is uh, our website, pprnoteco.com. Um, I do have a, a, a distressed mortgages group on LinkedIn and, and mm -hmm. I'm on bigger pockets a lot, answering questions and stuff like that. People are trying to do the note business. Uh, but yeah, you can go to our website, reach out to us, set up a call with one of our investor relations persons, you know. Okay. So I really appreciate it, Dave. I will put the links to your firm into the show notes. And I want to thank you so much for coming on today and uh, looking forward to connecting with you in the future. My pleasure, Charles. Good luck with everything. Take care. Talk to you soon. Hi guys, it's Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in getting involved with real estate, but you don't know where to begin, set up a free 30-minute strategy call with me at schedulecharles.com. That's schedulecharles.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars, LLC, exclusively.